My guest today is Ryan Booz. Ryan, how are you? We're doing great. How about you? Uh, can't complain at all. It's a beautiful day here in Chicago, and uh, I think spring is around the corner. I'm hoping. Yeah, I'm. Uh, we just had a little snowstorm come through last night. I'm a. Uh, I'm an amateur beekeeper, and so this is like. I keep waiting for the spring to turn, and then we keep getting these days of like, oh, but it's cold. I can't quite get out there yet. So. Oh my gosh! I should, I should introduce you to my friend Josh Holmes, who just uh, oh, yeah. a year or two ago began keeping bees. And it's, he could probably learn a, a thing or two from you. Uh, it's so much fun. I really enjoy it. Uh, what do you do for a living at your day job out in uh, yeah, so State my day College, job, Pennsylvania, I think? That's correct. I get to work remotely, uh, which was really a result of the pandemic. So I'm, I'm near Penn State University. I've been here for a lot of my life. Uh, and until the, the pandemic happened, you know, really worked uh, locally. A lot of the places I would have wanted to go weren't open at the time to remote. And so the pandemic really opened those opportunities. Uh, for a few years, I was with Timescale, which is a Postgres uh, company building some capabilities into Postgres. And now I'm with Redgate Software, which a lot of people in the in the .NET and SQL Server space know who Redgate is. Uh, a lot of my um, coworkers, uh, you know, people that mentors I look up to, um, and so I'm doing developer advocacy for them for our tooling and for Postgres specifically as they venture out into things other than SQL Server and .NET. Excellent. Yeah, they're uh, they've been big in the data community for a long time. Uh, I, I'm really not familiar with Postgres. I've, uh, I know of it, and I know SQL Server, which I think is pretty similar. They're both enterprise relational databases, right? Correct. But, yeah, you've, been, absolutely. Uh, uh, but you've been talking about Postgres a lot lately. Uh, tell, tell I have. Well, if, somebody, if somebody comes up to you and says, what is Postgres SQL? What's your answer? Yeah, great great question. Um, so first, it's it's not Postgres SQL. And that's, it's one of those, it's PostgresQL. Or it's Postgres, nope. and it's funny how that's. But I told you, I never, I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> Postgres oh, I hate all the time. QL. Thank you. I'll correct myself. Yeah, Postgres QL. Forward. There's history to that too. It's uh, you know the the project is really um, you know there's like 35, 40 years in this project, and it really goes back to Berkeley days in the 70s and 80s. And then what happened is when it finally just went fully open source, very very permissive license. Uh, one of the changes in 1995 and 96 was they had not supported SQL up until that point. So the, uh, Michael Stonebreaker, who really developed this, really believed in his own language. It's called Quell. Uh, but everyone else in the world was going to SQL. Okay. And so when they, when they ended up open sourcing it, that was the big change as they got rid of Quell and supported SQL. And they wanted to make a big deal of it. So instead of just Postgres, they changed it to PostgresQL, got which it. has confused everyone for 30 years. How do you say <laughs> <Okay>. that? <laughs> so. PostgresQL. All right. Now I know. Yeah. Um, That's great. Okay, oh, and you, yeah. you're a former SQL Server guy, right? Yeah, I used SQL Server for a, a good 15 years, uh, .NET and SQL Server for a number of, of companies that I was working with. Um, and that's really what happened. I, you know, I, I tell the story when I've given a, this talk at some, uh, you know, some conferences recently. I was looking for transition. I'd been with the company for about 14 years, and uh, I was really getting into data, Power BI, big data, data analytics local company in State College that does predictive analytics needed help. And, I said, and as far as I knew, they were a .NET SQL Server shop. And so I interviewed, signed the contract. And in the month that I you know, took to get over there, turns out that they'd been planning to leave SQL Server the whole time. And so when I showed up, they had transitioned to Postgres over that period. They had been working on it and no one told me. And so I showed up and I was like, hey, where's, where's the SQL Server? They're like, oh, we got rid of that two weeks ago. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> And so I had to, I had used Postgres at some point back in the early 2000s. So I, I had to dig in again and start to learn. And um, I, I see more and more people, particularly in the .NET and SQL server space, having that same situation where, you know, as we were just talking about code mesh and kind of this polyglot idea of just, there's, there's a technology for every potential solution, right? So people are trying to understand which is the, what's the right option for you know, this relational data, what does it mean? What does it look like? What is the licensing like? And so I just see more and more people asking for help, and that's why I love talking about it, particularly from that perspective. Uh, how was that transition from, was it, is there, are there major differences that you had to overcome, or is it kind of just evolutionary? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, I would say it, it, it was frustrating at first, and the biggest frustration for most people that I have seen coming from 
from a, something like SQL Server really is around tooling, right? Microsoft has just done such an excellent job over the last 20 plus years providing really great tooling around something like SQL Server, right? And when you come to, to Postgres, and, and maybe to some extent MySQL, if, if that were an option as well, open source nature, um, you know, there's, there's many options for how you connect and manage and do. There's not one specific, you know, this is the only way that everyone does this. Um, or the only way that, that is supported is a command line application, right? And so learning how to interact with the database was, was really one of the first big hurdles. Um, you know, then there's just all kinds of little nuances. I expected it to work this way because SQL Server has a lot of niceties built in. Well, it doesn't quite work that way over here. Um, a good example is T-SQL. Uh, the way that SQL Server works, everything you write in SQL Server when you execute it, unless you tell it otherwise, is interpreted as T-SQL. So T-SQL is, is a superset of SQL, right? They've added their own right. nuances. So something like, yeah, so something like variables. You can't just write a variable in the middle of a SQL script and start doing something with it. That's not how Postgres works. It's a SQL standard. You have to actually invoke their language, which is PG, PLPG SQL. Um, and so just some simple things I used to do uh, was, was frustrating at times. So you're saying that the, I think the, the, the SQL that's supported in PostgreSQL is actually less than the SQL that's supported in SQL Server. Is that right? Um, it's closer to ANSI SQL. It is closer ANSI SQL in how it normally works. So when I open up a, a terminal or a connection to the database with whatever tool I'm using, the script that we're running is pure SQL. So uh, you know the ANSI standard doesn't have procedural languages in it, right? It's a, it's a functional language. And so it's something like a variable just isn't supported in ANSI SQL. You have to have something on top of that. And so I can create a function. I have access to all kinds of cool stuff because it's a function. Um, but I can't just do that in normal. And we're just so used to that in SQL Server, right? Yeah. You have lots of scripts and you're looping and variables and what have you. So those are the things I that- got it. Oh, I see. I think I understand. Out. So the, the things that were built, Microsoft decided just to build these features right into the language, uh, to their version of the SQL language. Uh, what Postgres's solution was, let's create this extension, extend into, what'd you call it? PLPG, I think is. Yeah, PLPG SQL, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, and did you say that there's not a an IDE that you have to do everything from the command line? No, there are hundreds of IDEs, um, but there's not one supported one, right? There's not, oh, Postgres is an open source project. And so there are a couple uh, IDEs that are very ubiquitous. Uh, one is, P, uh, <laughs> gotta remember what it's called here, is uh, PG Admin. Yeah, that's so easy. Why did I forget that? That is provided by one of the, the companies that has provided, you know, has really uh, invested a lot in Postgres over the last 15 or 20 years, and they support the development of that. It's, it's a pseudo web-based um, IDE, kind of like uh, back in the day, uh, PHP, MySQL Admin, or something like that I used to use way back in the day. Uh, but, you know, it has some features that lack some features. Uh, DBeaver is very, very popular. So there are, uh, Postgres has become the fastest growing open source database, really the fastest growing relational database in the world right now by a number of mm. measures. Mm. Um, and because of that, it really is becoming like the standard for connectivity. So even if a database like Cosmos, you know, Cosmos isn't a great example, but something like Cosmos, there's Yugabyte, there's all kinds of databases, uh, CockroachDB, others who are not, they are not SQL databases specifically, but their standard for connectivity is Postgres. And they'll say, hey, you can connect like we are Postgres. So that's really become the standard. So there are uh, just countless tools. Probably anything you're using has a way to connect to Postgres because it's just become the standard of like minimum connection ability, right? Hmm, okay. Uh, what do you do your development in? I primarily use dBeaver. Uh, it is an open source tool. Uh, it's the closest I've found to SSMS, you know, it certainly doesn't have all the features, yeah. uh, but it's just kind of look and feel, at least gets me partway there, which is fun. All right. Tell me about some of the features that Postgres offers that SQL Server does not. Uh, probably the biggest one is, um, is extensibility. I'm actually just making sure I'm calling up my slide deck over here because we had talked about some of this ahead of time. Uh, but that's the one that I almost always start with. 
is that it's such a unique concept from a SQL Server perspective. And Microsoft isn't wrong. And SQL Server isn't wrong, but it's a proprietary database. And so we are limited to the feature set based on what Microsoft decides they want to develop. Where Postgres is open source, so there's a lot of community sourcing. Uh, there's a lot of you know, very, very active community, worldwide community. But they made a decision maybe 10 to 12, 13 years ago to provide a way to extend the functionality of Postgres out of the box. So you and I can just download, install Postgres, mm -hmm. and then there are many different, uh, what we call them extensions, um, that you can simply install into Postgres, and you get new functionality. And you can do things like, yeah, yeah you, can you, can, uh, you can modify the way the query plan runs. You can modify the way data is stored on disk. You can create new index types. Um, you can uh, just you can do something different with backup, right? And so it's it's Postgres saying, here's how we're doing it. We're going to give you hooks into all of these areas, and if in the you know in the uh, process of doing an operation, if if you're listening for something, you can take control at that point. A great example for me was again uh, for the last two years before coming to Reg, I worked for Timescale, and Timescale is simply an extension to Postgres. You install Postgres. You install this extension and you get things like compression, right? Out of the box, Postgres doesn't support columnar compression or columnar storage at all. Uh, Timescale uh, does some of that. Uh, it, it manages partitioning for you as an extension. You can partition manually on your own with some tools or you can use something like Timescale. Um, so those kinds of features, it, it's like a, it, it's really opened up a lot. So Microsoft actually a couple years ago bought uh, Citus which is what runs their Cosmos Postgres offering. Um, and it's horizontal scaling, and it's simply an extension. So it's Postgres with an extension that allows you to create a horizontally scalable uh, Postgres installation, which out of the box you can't do. Interesting. Really cool stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I always tell people, you know, one of the really interesting, uh, just a really random extension that turns out to be really helpful is they have one called, for instance, HypoPG, uh, Hypo Hypo Index. It's a hypothetical index extension. So you can install this extension, create an index that doesn't really get created, but then you can see if the uh, planner would use that index. That's, would an, help. that's an extension. And it's an extension. Okay. And someone wrote it a couple years ago. It's just really cool. Very cool. Speaking of indexes, I was looking at your slide deck, and you yeah. mentioned that there are uh, more index types. There are six index types in Postgres. Uh, the old, I don't even know what an index type is other than uh, clustered versus non-clustered. What, yeah. what, what exactly oh. does that mean, index type? Great question. So most relational databases start with one kind of index, which is B-tree index. That okay. is kind of the standard for how you create an index. And, you know, it's, it's a B-tree, right? You start with a node and it, it uh, parses down through the pages of, of the storage. Um, and so every relational database supports B-tree. Um, SQL Server, and then the way it's stored, clustered versus non-clustered, would mean how is the data ordered within the index and within the actual page. So in SQL Server, you have clustered indexes. And that simply means that the base index, you can have one per table, and the actual data on disk for the entire table is stored in order. Right. That doesn't happen in most other databases. In most other databases, it's just a heap. You just keep inserting rows, and they end up somewhere, and the index gets you to where they are. Right. Uh, so we have B-tree, and then SQL Server has um, column store index, which was introduced, I think, what, in SQL Server 2012, maybe? Um, and then uh, that's about it. Postgres has B-tree, obviously. Uh, they have uh, hash index, so that's really nice if you have, you know, rather than the computer having to hash stuff in hash table at query time, if you already have the index, it's really fast to go find individual objects from equal and then they have, and that's really maybe the second reason Postgres has really gotten so popular over the last number of years. They've supported for more than a decade, probably 15 years, uh, an extension. Again, there's another extension called PostGIS. And it's, it's a you know, geolocation, geo, um, uh, you know, mapping uh, capabilities within the database. And because of those capabilities and having to do things like nearest distance and all of that, um, they have index types come out of the box. They're called GIN and just indexes, and they help you do things like nearest neighbor. Uh, really good for range types. So I, there's actually a data type that's a range, beginning and ending range. And so just can help you understand, do these ranges overlap? Right. So those are the kinds of things. And then the framework for those 
again, are built into core. And so if you decide there's another index that would be useful for your data, but helpful in the way that GIN is set up, you can create a GIN index for your data type. You know, if you have a custom, a new custom data type. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Are, are there things that you miss from SQL Server, features that aren't available in Postgres? <laughs> oh, man. Yes, there are. Um, What's the honestly, one is... ones? <laughs> The one that everyone comes back to, so every person that I've interacted with over the last, I'd say, three or four years, you know, I often, I watch Twitter for these comments because I've had those same visceral feelings, like, why doesn't Postgres do this? <laughs> and so I'll usually interact with those folks. Um, the first one simply is query plans. And so uh, Postgres, the way that query plans uh, were implemented years ago, it's a textual version of a query plan. Um, it doesn't have nearly the number of uh, again, in Postgres, we call them nodes. In SQL Server, we call them operations or operators. Top and um, loops and, you know, whatever, the loop hash and, I mean, hash join and loop join and all this. So those are nodes in Postgres. We don't have nearly as many types out of the box. Again, extensions can create their own. I keep going back to that. Mm -hmm. But it's all textual. And so it can be really hard to parse. You know, when I want to uh, improve a query exactly kind of where I've started, where I need to begin. Or SQL Server, you right-click, show me that graphical plan, and you, you know, there's so much education, mm -hmm. excuse me, around how to, you know, how to use that tool to, to improve uh, the query. It is getting better release by release, um, and there's a, a number of uh, s uh, startups, uh, honestly, that are trying to help improve that situation, both in hints and things like that, but that's probably number one. And then number two is, is really tan similar, but a little bit tangential, which is just kind of the uh, natural intelligence out of the box. Again, Microsoft has put so much effort into things like Query Store, uh, right? So it just works. And if something goes wrong, I can go back in history and see how the query was working previously. That doesn't exist by default in Postgres. I can, you know, there are some third party toolings that are doing that. Uh, even Redgate, you know, we're working on some of those things for monitoring Postgres. Um, but that's, you know, it's always around performance and query tuning. It's just learning a new paradigm. That's probably the biggest stuff. Okay. Are, are you uh, familiar with the licensing model of Postgres? Is there a, is it all, I hear open source and often that means free to use and yeah. put in your commercial applications. Are there different versions that are maybe uh, freemium or paid? Yeah, really good question. Um, Postgres itself is 100% free. Uh, when they released it in 96, they're probably one of the leading, uh, the license in total is like 127 lines of written text, yeah. or maybe 127 words. I forget, it's very small. That's, it's very that's pretty small, but it's licenses. Um, <laughs> and it's just basically include this, do whatever you want, and just make sure that you give credit where credit is due. Mm. And that is one of the reasons why so much has been built on top of Postgres. A lot of people don't know, for instance, Redshift, which is an AWS product, uh, has really been a behemoth in the BI world for 10 plus years. Uh, you know, it, 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 that was based off of a fork of Postgres because it had such a permissive license. We can take this core, we have all this functionality, we can build a different storage engine on top of it to do column store processing and, and parallel, you know, massive parallel processing MPP. Um, so that's, it's very, very permissive. Now, what that means is I'm never locked in. I don't have to, um, if I go to vendor A, B, and C, as long as it's truly Postgres, there shouldn't be anything that's kept back from me, right? So Postgres, a vendor A, and Postgres from vendor B, as anything that's in core should be available to anybody because there's no license. They can't stop you from using something that's not licensed. The extensions become where you'll find differences. So Microsoft, for instance, if you have a you know, Postgres service there, they might only support, and I don't know the number, but let's say they support 60 uh, extensions that you can install. And some of the reasons they don't allow extensions, some extensions have their own licensing. Um, and then some uh, some extensions, language sp extensions specifically. So if you want to write store procedures in a R or you know Python or Rust or whatever, some of them don't have what we call tr a trusted layer. And so because Postgres is running on the server itself, uh, there are ways for you to break out and potentially impact the server itself unless it's trusted. And so there are only a few languages that are fully trusted, so not every provider uh, supports those depending on the environment. I see. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, I know that I'm looking at your slide deck here, and there's a lot of information here, but is there anything that you really feel like we need to get out to the world during this conversation yeah. that we haven't talked about? So the one reason this has, has come up, and I don't think we've mentioned this yet during the recording, is, you know, as a SQL Server developer, you know, I, I eventually had to come around and say, yeah, that was my job. I'm now in Postgres world. I'm going to choose to learn. And, and probably the, the two things that have come up the most for me are, one is community. So in the Microsoft and .NET space, you, know, you and I were just talking about CodeMash mm -hmm. and what a great conference it is. And there's a lot of flavor of community there, which I found very similar within the SQL Server community. You know, there's a, a very active and diverse community. Yeah. And there is in the Postgres space, but it was just more challenging to find. Now that I've started to find it, I see that, oh, it's just as vibrant. It's just different. And part of the reason is a lot of the leadership in the Postgres space, not a lot, I'd say maybe half of kind of the, the community leadership is, is out of Europe. And so there's just a different, there's different cultures and different flavors of how those things work. And so that was one of the things I had to understand. And like, okay, this is where I can go to start to find community. These are the conferences you're going to find. I'll find people that have similar interests. And so, you know, that's one of the things I think we're all trying to do. Um, it just build some of that community a little bit better as people yeah. come in. And the second thing, uh, particularly from a SQL Server perspective, is the introduction of Babelfish uh, from AWS. So again, Microsoft, I'm sorry, Postgres mm -hmm. is open source. It's very, you know, very permissive license. So uh, AWS, Microsoft, Google, they've all provided, created their own forks in Postgres that have unique features. AWS is by far, currently today, the biggest provider of Postgres services in the world. Hmm. With RDS and Aurora. Um, huge investment in Postgres and, and what's happening there. And so uh, about three years ago, they announced that they are creating a, a fork of Postgres. Their desire, their hope, is eventually to merge it with the mainline Postgres. They don't want it to be separate. They want it to eventually move forward. And it's a tool called Babelfish. And so they have invested a lot of effort. And it's a transparent layer that will translate T-SQL into Postgres, so you can connect to a Postgres database with all of your SQL Server tooling, whether it's SSMS, .NET, whatever. And their goal is to make it a transparent connection. So you can eventually move off of SQL Server, primarily for licensing issues, feature issues. You're not, you know, you don't have to worry about cores and so forth, and move over to RDS. In their case, now it's open source, so you can actually take that. You can build that version of Postgres right now if you want. You can play with it yourself. Um, and so I think when I you know, started talking about this more, when I saw that, they recognize there's a large gap of what's supported right now, right? Some of that is just what it is. Um, but they're, they're continuing to evolve and, and make uh, ways for that to be successful. And so I think more and more .NET SQL Server developers are going to start to get that question. Hey, could we move to Postgres use this layer as an as a initial way to move the application and then slowly you know, move over to more Postgres-specific stuff. I don't know how fast it's going to happen, but I'm sure it already has happened to some level. Um, again, working at Redgate, we see many people that have been .NET shops, SQL Server shops, for 15, 20 years, and now they're starting to ask us about Postgres. And do, you, do your tools support Postgres? You know, can you monitor Postgres? It's happening at the enterprise layer, and I think it's going to happen more. So that's one of the things that just to be aware of it. Yeah. And take it as a great opportunity. Like, honestly, I would say I love what I brought in from SQL Server, but I love that there's a new thing that I can enjoy and start to, to learn more of. And what have you. So, yeah, fun. I do appreciate that there are tools that can not only help the learning curve, but also ease that, uh, that, that transition as you're migrating code from one database to another. And I also appreciate the Douglas Adams reference in the name <laughs> of the product Babelfish. Oh, yeah? I don't know that. Oh, it's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The oh, little fish. I just, uh, it's, a, it's a little fish that you put in your ear, and it just listens and then sends to your brain these sort of brain waves that instantly translate from any that's so language in the galaxy. <laughs> uh, I just was. I listened to a, a news podcast every day, and they just reviewed something. Uh, I don't know if it's an anniversary from the Hitchhiker's Guide. It might have just passed in the last week. It's really funny to see two references in, in one week. <laughs> Uh, I'm a fan. I actually met Douglas Adams once, and so. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> many years nice. ago. 
Uh, and and now I met you, Ryan. So and I've learned a lot today. Thank you so much for being on my show. Oh, you're welcome. This has been a pleasure, David. I've I followed you for a long time, and I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, and I'm I can't wait till we can connect in person. That'd be great. <laughs> Keep your friends close and your technology in its proper place.